Oh. Uh, Timothy, I don't have the button to go live. Okay. Only the host does. Okay, I'll do that. Go ahead and let everybody in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Eric and David. It's great to see you both. And Kahal, Kahil, Kahal, I'm sorry. I, I saw it on your face. It's okay. Uh, Khalil. <laughs> awesome. Ooh. Welcome, welcome with us. Where welcome, you guys are everyone. In awesome information. We have lots of great information coming your way today. Welcome, Edwin. Yeah, that name sounds familiar. You guys just introduced me to Edwin. Mm -hmm. Hi, Edwin. Good yeah. greetings. Good, good morning. <clears throat> so we will be recording this. Plus, we are also going on Facebook Live into our Giver Marketing private Facebook group. Just to let you all know that we are doing that. And where's everyone dialing in from today? With Orlando. Orlando, awesome. What's the weather like down there? Uh, nice and warm right now, but uh, we'll see what happens in the next 30 minutes as great clouds roll through. So yeah, I was gonna say that, has it rained yet there today? <laughs> yeah, right. So you, you never know, it'll, it'll be uh, burning hot in the morning and a monsoon in the afternoon, so. The 3 p.m. shower, right? Exactly. <laughs> And even if there isn't one, chances are the humidity is so high, you got to take a shower and change your shirt anyway. So Correct, correct. You'd be surprised what happens in the winter where, you know, it might be 40 degrees in the morning and then 90 mm -hmm. at five o'clock in the afternoon. So, All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live on Facebook. So I'm just letting you know this is being recorded for future benefit. We're going to rock and roll. We're all about starting on time, having lots of good questions, interaction. We're going to have some fun today learning about marketing and assimilation give me a give me a yes in the chat box if you know what assimilation is just at least a general idea what what is the word assimilation give me a yes in the chat box don't lie tell the truth if you I might, I might even call michael might call on you he might say hey what's what's assimilation but um give me a yes in the chat box if you know what assimilation is awesome awesome okay we're getting some great comments here in the vip zoom room ladies and gentlemen if you're listening on Facebook, hey, we're curious. Do you know what assimilation is? Because this is marketing meets assimilation. And we're about to um, uh, dive in here just in just a minute and be able to share with you um, exactly what we have to offer when it comes to dialing in your organization around marketing and assimilation. Give me one second. I'm going to check one thing. Make sure that we got our slide deck dialed in exactly where we need to start. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up, get ready. How are we looking on our screen? Can you guys see my shared screen when I click on it in three, two, one? Can you see that? Good. Give me a thumbs up. Awesome, awesome. If you guys could do me a favor and go ahead and uh, mute yourself. We're, we're planning on having several dozen folks here on the training today and on the conversation today. So if you could do that yourself, that way Stacy doesn't have to play, play like she's uh, chasing cats everywhere and figuring that all that out. So we're going to have some fun um, interacting later. But as we begin, I just want to introduce Michael Sharp. Michael Sharp, wave your hand, say hi. Everybody knows who you are in the room. Good. I'm Timothy Morgan. We're here to help you with a two-hour masterclass, one hour about marketing and one hour about assimilation, which you will get the definition to in just a minute. All right, so if you wanna learn more about Giver Marketing, go ahead and just Google us. We're the highest rated reviewed network of marketing specialists in the country. There's a lot of kind words that have been said out there and we're super proud of that. We, we, we're humbled to be able to help causes, companies and community leaders with their outreach efforts and their marketing. We love, love, love referencing Bob Berg uh, he has a book called The Go-Giver, and he says, all things being equal, we do business, and we interact with people that we know, like, and trust. Uh, if, you want if you want to see more donations coming in, if you want to see more revenue coming into your organization or your business, uh, we definitely want to zero in on a mindset of trust. And so that's the backdrop by which we 
walk through the Giver Marketing Blueprint. And it's important to note, as we jump in here, and we're jumping in the deep end of the pool here, so take get those notepads out, start taking some notes here. You are experiencing the beginnings of a coaching relationship. So if you need a coach in marketing or, or in team building, team dynamics, uh, culture for your organization, you're going to want to talk to myself or Michael and, and be able to uh, give us the privilege to walk you through that as a coach. So our, our job is to draw out the potential within you as an individual or your team, okay? And it's important to note, too, that coaching produces 529% ROI versus doing something alone. So we're here to help you. We're here to guide you. And we're here to walk with you, okay? So we take a coaching approach. We're not pitching much today at all. We're really just giving you value and so that you can uh, apply this maybe get started yourself and then uh, bring us along as you need, okay? Marketing Blueprint, the Giver Marketing Blueprint is about to happen. Here we go, let's jump right in. Give me a, give me a, a thumbs up if, if you guys are ready, you're, you're here, you're present, you can see the screen, everything's good. Okay, good, awesome. I'm Timothy Morgan, founder of Giver Marketing and the Giver Marketing Network, which is a group of about 20 marketing specialists by the way, if you know any marketing specialists, send them our way. We're, we're, we're growing rapidly and we're hoping to hit 100 team members here in the next 24 months. So we're glad to be able to, to connect with your marketing friends out there in the world. Many of them are here today, so really appreciate connecting as well. All right, so pay, if you pay really close attention, you'll see that there's four action assignments today. Uh, we give away a marketing accelerator package if you complete seven action assignments, okay? So the, the first four are gonna be presented today. If you want the $1,500 value, uh, it's a reward for just paying attention and taking some action, okay? Um, you'll wanna pay attention to not only the four today, but there's also three more that we talk about in our Facebook group, in our private group, which you can see there at the bottom of the screen, and also in future trainings. So you're welcome to enjoy that accelerator package for your organization if you pay attention to the action assignments. And what you'll get is a 30-minute session with a certified marketing coach from our network. You'll also have the ability to tap into our visibility service, which allows people to find your company or cause more uh, easily. And if you need some graphic design service done, we also offer that as a part of that accelerator package, which you can earn at no cost if you take action today and complete all seven of them, which you see on the screen. You're welcome to take a screenshot of this. Many people do, and it helps them track how they're doing when it comes to um, really completing the tasks necessary, the action assignments. Some people call them micro assignments in order to earn that reward, okay? Again, no cost, which is just our way of saying thank you for participating, paying attention. All right. So what's the story behind the blueprint? What's this giver marketing blueprint? Where did it come from? Why is it special? What, you know, what, why am I supposed to pay attention here? Well, after coaching, collaborating with thousands of causes and companies over the last decade, there was a pattern that emerged. I was dialing for dollars personally at a company called Faith Highway. And I would make a hundred phone calls a day and people would get on the phone. I would get, get this is back when you get on the phone and then Zoom wasn't really a thing, right? And you bring up their website, their social media and all these other things. And you start giving them consultations. And I found that there was a pattern. The pattern was those who had these four pieces in place were the top like 5% of their industry or their, or, or their organizational uh, you know, vertical, right? And so what I did was I put it into a really basic, simple training that allows organizations to kind of improve incrementally in these four areas so that they could become, uh, they could stop becoming the, the best kept secret in their industry, basically. We just want to get the word out about causes and companies doing good, right? So we want to, we want to make sure you have the tools necessary in order to do this. Now, it's important to note that these build on each other. If you don't get your brand, and this goes for personal brand as well. You know, I'm looking at different faces here. I'm, going, I'm thinking, okay, if you're out, you know, job hunting or if you're out, you know, uh, starting a, uh, your own uh, small business where you're, you're the solopreneur, whatever 
or if you're a larger organization like Pinnacle Forum or some of these others that are represented here today, we want to make sure that our brand is dialed in. It's fresh. It feels, it's modern. It, it makes sense. It's clear. And so we're going to go through that a little bit today, but we don't really have the right to move to the next step until the first step is done. So these are in order. One, two, three, four. Think of them like the four spiritual laws of marketing. All right. <laughs> so here we go. Your action assignments are going to be directly related to those four pieces. We're very serious about doing this in order. We want you to be successful, okay? So, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to take those action assignments when, I, when we bring them up, up on the screen, and you're going to write them down or, or remember them or take a screenshot and then post your action assignments in our private group. Many of you are already in the group. I've invited you personally. Some of you still need to be accepted. Stacy, give me a thumbs up if you're going to accept everybody in this room to our private group. Yes, of course, right? Okay, good. So we want you to post your action assignments, your micro assignments into that group so you get credit. And then you can earn that reward as well, okay? It'll be good for your business. It'll be good for everybody involved. All right, let's talk about marketing. There's a little bit of confusion around marketing. What's the difference between marketing and sales? Put it in the chat box, put it in the comments. I, we, don't, we don't mind all different definitions, but what we're gonna do here is, is really dr drill down on what marketing is versus sales. Because there's a bit of a, because we're an online world, there's a bit of a confusion around this. Um, sales, we really, we really view as kind of the art of having a conversation or during a decision meeting. When somebody's about to make a decision or a group's about to make a decision, that, that's, that's the art and science of sales, right? You're navigating through those buying questions, those decision uh, questions, those kind of things. What marketing is, is very different. And we train on marketing. We coach on marketing. We don't train on sales, okay? Marketing is pre-sales communication. Everything that happens between, before the decision meeting is marketing. Can I hear an amen in the chat box if everything before that decision meeting could be considered marketing. Every impression, every experience, everything that affects our five senses. And so we want to really uh, encourage us to look at marketing as communication in more of a broad sense, but then we're going to dig deeper <clears throat> into each element of marketing in a minute, okay? All right, so marketing, what do you track? You track conversations, you track appointments, you track attention, you track likes and comments and activities that help build trust, right? With sales, you're tracking one thing. It's the transaction. And this is where a lot of representatives within your team will make a mistake and they won't realize that they're actually still in the marketing process and earning the trust when they're acting like they're in the sales process, okay? Michael, Can do you have I any thoughts thing, on that? Tim? Yeah, what do you got? <clears throat> yeah, one thing I'd add, and <clears throat> part of what I do is work with sales teams. Sales is, a, it's like marketing exposes and all that. Once it comes in or whatever, the brand is built, sales is actually a process. It's more than the transaction. It's, it's the process to take the baton from marketing move forward. And and if it's just about the tracking the sales, there's, there's micro steps that happen in between that to actually take that lead. And so there, there's more mileposts there too, right? But yeah. Yeah, so we wanna just understand kind of where we are, right? I mean, you're, we're helping folks with their marketing and then that ends up leading into a, a sales conversation, but then there's follow-up that happens. And we're gonna talk about some of that, but at the end of the day, we need to know what conversation we're having. Is this a marketing conversation or is this a decision meeting? And, and if we assume there's a decision meeting before we've earned that right to do that, we're basically blowing so many opportunities. It's unreal. I mean, how many have had spam emails or, you know, messages come in? They don't, there's not even any context. You don't even know what's going on. And, and they're trying to sell you something or pitch you something. And there's really no trust that's been established at all. To me, that, that is probably one of the biggest black guys in the marketing industry, which is why we talk about this. And by the way, um, 
when it comes right down to it, prospecting or reaching out to folks is technically marketing, not sales. And so when we got to be careful of our language sometimes too, right? Otherwise, we're going to train our team to go into sales mode too early. All right, so marketing gets you to the red zone if you're an American football fan, but sales gets you to the end zone. We all want the touchdown, but we got to get cl- we got to get close. Otherwise, we're just throwing hail marys all day long. We don't want to do that. We want to get really close, right? So prospecting again is technically marketing, not sales. We want to uh, keep that in mind as we're talking to potential donors, potential you know potential clients, whoever it is. We want to make sure and build that trust through great branding first. All right. Starting off, branding, best definition I've seen anywhere is by this lady, Michelle Van Otten. She's a sweetheart. She's awesome. Had some interaction with her. She's great. But her definition of branding is where it's at. Like this, this goes for church, churches, businesses, whatever, community leaders, like how people experience you in the marketplace is your brand. It's not your logo. It's it's not just your logo. I mean, it includes some of these imagery pieces and other things, but it's the totality of how people would maybe even talk about you to somebody else. How you're experienced is really when it comes. It is, this applies to every interaction we have with any potential opportunity that we have, right? All right, so if marketing is communication, your brand is how people feel when experiencing you or your company or your brand, okay? So we're, look, we're not a touchy-feely organization. We just understand the psychology of this. We understand how God designed us. At the end of the day, how people feel determines whether they want to continue to interact with you or not, period. Like that's just how it works. So branding is the baseline, the foundation for your marketing efforts. You also want to be very clear about who you're called to. Who is your who? We won't spend too much time on this today. If you know who your audience is, this will determine a little bit of, of how you interact and how you frame the language around, around those conversations. You just want to be very cognizant of the fact you're called to this group of people. That's why you want an alignment with who you are and who you're called to so you don't have to put on two different faces every day. You want to be very true and very authentic. There's a big push right now to be very authentic in the marketing space, and we're big fans of that, okay? And so whoever you're called to, just be yourself and the right people will be magnetically attracted to you. All right, this one's fun. A lot of people take a screenshot of this. I didn't realize that was going to happen when we first put the slide up uh, several years ago. But this is like a personality test for you and your brand. Many of us in the room, most of us in the room, will have a strength in one of these areas. And Michael's sitting sitting there going, yep, that's absolutely correct. Because he's going to be talking a little bit more in depth about about this. Not a little bit more, a lot more in depth about this. But ultimately, there's an area here where where we're not going to be very strong. It's We can call it our weakness. We can call it our, our, our greatest place of improvement or whatever you want to call it, right? But ultimately, you might want to outsource or connect or partner with somebody else to help with another aspect of your brand if you want to put it that way. And then there's one that you could probably pull off for a while. Um, It's maybe not a weakness, maybe not a strength. It's kind of an, you're kind of average at it. But out of these three, these are the main three components we consider when looking at your brand, okay? Any questions about that? Feel free to put them in the chat box. A lot of people at this point start having questions because we're getting to the nitty gritty. All right, we will love questions and Stacy will field those for us. Sensory branding. Like I said before, God designed us in a certain way. So let's consider the five senses as a kind of a a checklist to to see how we're doing when it comes to our brand. How are we being experienced visually with sound, smell, taste, touch? Like when we're in the room together, great. But what about when we're just on Zoom? The sight and sound become exponentially important. I mean, invaluable for us to be able to connect well. Okay. So we want to really evaluate that almost like uh, like a, any great organization would, right? Make sure we're, we're being experienced in totality very well. And a little hint for you, a little tip, a video is up to 50 times more effective than just a picture or auditory experience alone. 
And I love podcasts. I love, you know, a great, you know, we have graphic designers on the team. All that's good. I mean, you're even seeing some, you know, some great graphic design and everything right now too. But really, ultimately, you're experiencing a video experience, uh, you know, exp- training right now. So ultimately, we want to see video incorporated more into our brands as we go along. There's even uh, components like on LinkedIn and Facebook where you can actually create a video as part of your LinkedIn profile and some different things like this, right? Video is where we're, we're here. Like this is because of health crisis and some other things that have happened, technology in the world, we have now fast forwarded. What should have taken about 10 years is now here today. So we got to be in, in the game when it comes to video and doesn't have to be professionally done. I mean, look at my backdrop. This is just me. Like we're just talking, like you can do it totally organically. Right. Authority branding, connect with the right people, get on the right podcast, talk to the right folks, be in the right community at the right community events with the, with the people that you align with, people that you actually want to be more like. You know the old adage, you're, you become like the five people you spend the most time with? Do that with your brand. Just connect with the people you want to be like and hang out with them. Some of them are going to be you know, a few steps ahead of you in your organization. That's fine. Do that and just kind of hang on their coattails and have some fun and, and learn and grow. We've had people come through our organization that have outgrown us. And now we're actually asking them to be our power partners, right? So we're, we're good with that in all humility. I mean, let's just rock and roll and do some good, good in the world, right? All right, here's your first micro assignment. Pay close attention. And for sake of time, I'm gonna give you like the 30 second version of my origin story so that you can get an example of how to do this. But your origin story is really one of the only things that makes you different. And this can go for an individual or for a company. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a hybrid, okay? Here's here's my background story, my origin story. I was in the nonprofit space for years and years and years, loved being involved in community, also bought, built and sold micro businesses along the way. But I found that it was really difficult to connect with marketing professionals that I could trust that would be here today, do great work, but then also be here months and months and months down the road as we're growing. And not to mention that there's a cost consideration involved too. So we could go out and hire a large agency for 10, 20, 50, $100,000 a month or whatever it is. But uh, that, that was a little pricey for my smaller organizations I was involved with, okay? And so we ended up starting Giver Marketing as a solution to that, where we have really the ability to match clients and community leaders with marketing talent at a fraction of the cost of a large agency, but we function with the talent level of a large agency. And so now we're able to really come alongside those causes, companies, community leaders, get the word out. And that's why we're, we're really in business is to, to make that happen. We're, we're tired of the negative news, man. We want the media to be full of positivity. So that's a little bit of my origin story, okay? And how it leads into my company as well, right? And so we want to naturally let that origin story kind of un, unfold uh, who we are, why we do what we do. And there's two parts, your background with some kind of aha moment or a solution or a problem that you're solving, something that goes, aha, and then you go into why and how you help your who. Notice there's nothing in here about what you do. I didn't go into the nitty gritty details of, you know, and we do this and that to, you know, help build websites and manage social media and graphic design and visibility. I didn't go into all that. I went into who I am, why and how we help our who. And so this is going to be your action assignment, and it's a very good exercise. I've talked to multi-million dollar companies that their their key leaders need to understand how to share their story. Very, very, very important. And there's also some advanced levels of this that you can read from StoryBrand, Donald Miller, award-winning author, best-selling author from over a decade ago. He now has a marketing company called StoryBrand. That's the advanced version or or the version you build on top of your origin story. Origin story is the foundation. And then you build like story brand and some of these other great concepts on top of that. If you don't have your origin story, I'm sorry. People aren't going to listen to you. 
Like there, there won't be an emotional connection. So we wanna make sure that you have that. One minute intro video of your origin story. Just take your phone out and just start talking. Your background with an aha moment, of course, that leads into why and how you help your who. Why and how you help your who. And you can practice, you can, <laughs> Stacy. how many times does it take you to do your origin story? About 20. <laughs> I actually it's just good. It's good found practice. them on my computer and, and um, got rid of the ones that were not relevant. And it's changed. So that's the other thing to remember too, that mm -hmm. you may start one spot, but your origin story may change as you evolve as a business to be more attractive to your, to your who, once you get the who is your who down. Yeah. And it's important, it's, it's important to say it this way. The core of your story doesn't change much, but the language around it is more defined and it evolves as you grow. That's a, it's, a, it's a really good point, Stacey. Thank you for sharing that. So just go with what your story is now. Share with us a little bit of the background from the last decade or so. Maybe, you're, you know, just some significant moments, some aha points, some milestones, if you will, and then go into why and how you help your who. Okay. All right. Practice, practice, practice. By the way, that's a great uh, thing to share before a podcast, before uh, a combo masterclass, before uh, any kind of training, before a 10 minute phone call, before anything. And uh, we've actually even recorded some of this so that we can get it out to more people as well. All right. Visibility. This is the second piece. I'm going to rip through the rest of this because branding is generally where most of the questions are. I'm going to go through all the rest of this so fast. You can get a um, a refresher or a recording of this at our uh, Facebook group uh, if, if you'd like to see the replay, okay? All right, visibility. Once you're branded, you have the ability, the right, the green light to go visible, go public, okay? So think about it this way. We don't go public in our pajamas. So why would we wanna be visible if we're not branded? If we don't look the part, we don't look, professional and fresh and good to the audience, why in the world would we want to go, this, this, this goes from small organizations to multi, I've been in rooms of $30 billion companies, they're asking me to train their offices, and I'm going, guys, <laughs> on a personal level, you need to be branded. I know the corporate level that we got some good branding going on, but on a personal level, you have to have your LinkedIn pages, your social pages, like dialed in, they don't always have to be like uber uh, businessy or or they don't always have to be pitching your you know your organization in this way or that way. They just need to reflect you. It needs to make sense and be you know be really clean and understandable. All right, once that's done, then the question becomes: Can you be found? Can you be found easily with just searching in a basic search on Google or some other search engine? Try it out sometime. Go into a guest mode search or an incognito search, some kind, of, some kind of search where they're not tracking all your previous searches. Just type in your first name, the industry you're in, and this kind of your base, your, your, your home city, and see what happens. See if you come up at all. See what kind of weird pictures come up, what kind of weird articles come up. See if you're, you know, mixed up with some, like, uh, strange cat not even you, like, especially with a common name, like Michael Sharp or, you know, something else, like look yourself up, find out what's, what, what people are saying when they look up your name after a training like this, we're all going to be looking each other up and connecting with each other. What, what are they going to find? That's a really, it's like first impression. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're visible, but what are you finding? Uh, ultimately to be really well, well, like well found or easily found and visible which by the way, this is the foundation for your search engine optimization. You don't, you don't buy SEO until you do this. Like this is the baseline. Everything we're talking about is baseline. You can't, you, you can't not do this. You have to do this, right? For your brand. Uh, you gotta build a website with at least one page, at least a landing page, something that says, hey, I'm on the internet. Like this is my real estate. This is my deal. Even as an individual, whether you're, you know, job hunting or whether you're starting a multi-million dollar company, you should probably have a landing page of some kind that you own. It costs like $12 a year. Okay. So figure it out. Like you got it. You can do this. All right. Free platform for businesses, no matter how, how big or small. Google my business. 
big deal. It's worth tens of thousands of dollars to most companies, most organizations, churches. I run across churches. They have one. They have I've Google my business, but they have one star and it's like a three star. I'm like, what the heck? You guys need to get like at least your staff or somebody to go and say some kind words about your organization online. Goodness gracious, you look like you haven't been around for very long and the people who have visited don't really like what they're experiencing. It goes the same with businesses. I've seen businesses working with one that've been around 40 years. They had a few, you know, some 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 gaps in their visibility. Let's just put it that way, okay? I won't go into all of it, but there's a, a few platforms that most organizations should at least consider depending on your industry, okay? All right, any questions about that? Please put them in the chat box. Stacy, do we have anything yet? Good, okay. All right, here's a free tool. Just a little, little love for you guys, gals. Um, and Stacy will put this link in the chat box. And uh, it's funny because Zoom, you have to put that HTTPS for, for the link to be clickable and she'll do that for you. But ultimately, almost nine out of 10 people go online before making any kind of uh, decision, that a significant decision when it comes to interacting with you. So you wanna make sure that you are really looking sharp in multiple places online. It's, it's, it's your reputation that's at stake, okay? All right, so what you'll see with this tool that we're showing you and we're putting in the chat box, and eventually we'll put it in the Facebook group as well, is givermarketing.com slash visibility. It's a tool that allows you to see where you're listed and how consistent you are across the board. Uh, many companies will charge hundreds of dollars for this. Uh, we charge if you want us to update it for you, but at least uh, you should be able to get a glimpse at no cost of where you are when it comes to your visibility, okay? Try for a zero error rate with this particular tool. There'll be dozens and dozens of uh, platforms that they're gonna search across the internet, see where you're found. And uh, by the way, if you can't even search on this, that means you need a Google My Business page. That's like step one, even for an individual, a community leader, they need a Google My Business page, like their own personal page, whether you're a large company or an individual. Okay, and then you'll be able to use that tool. And also another tool, this is super fun. Once you get your Google My Business page and get, get some visibility going with other platforms and different things, then you'll be able to send a little link out to your friends and family and associates for them to give you some kind words. Stacy, can you put the, the uh, givermarketing.com slash kind words link in the chat box as well? That'll be a good opportunity for people to share some kind of words about the experience they're getting right now. And this is one of the reasons we're the highest rated reviewed in the country is because of this tool. It allows people to just say some nice, nice things about us on Google. Uh, we're trying to reach 100 five-star reviews and you'll help us get there. Um, also, um, as a little bit of a side note, we're gonna be uh, putting a link in the chat box as well. You're gonna get a bunch of goodies in the chat box. You might even wanna save your chat, uh, your chat at the end of our training or halfway through at least. Uh, eventually, during our break, we're gonna be giving you a link that will help set the stage for Michael Sharp's presentation here in a few minutes. That will uh, give you some insights on your own like, like core wiring, your core design, and, and, and really how God's designed you. <laughs> and it'll, it'll come clear as you answer some of these questions. It's, it's a core values index. And it's a super, super helpful tool for the training that's coming up second hour, okay? I wanna give a little shout out for that tool that's gonna happen here soon. And Stacy, if you wanna put it, that in early, that's fine. People can click on it, click around on it, look at it. Uh, different people like to do things in different orders, so that, that'll be good. All right, so this link that, um, that you have on the screen will allow people to give you kind words online. It'll, it'll bolster your reputation, your visibility. The search engines will catch it and you'll start uh, coming up more often when people are looking for you and the industries that you represent, okay? And because most people are going to these online reviews and, and, and these type of, uh, you know, kind words that are put everywhere online um, before making a buying decision, um, it's important that these, these are represented well for you, okay? And in some cases, they're more important than just like a random friend's recommendation. 
I don't know about you, but when somebody recommends like a restaurant or a business or a church or a nonprofit or something, I go online first before I go visit. So even if they, if a neighbor recommends something to me, I'm looking at their reviews before I actually make an action or before I take a next step. And so that's why this is so important. Okay. It doesn't happen all, you know, hundred percent, but like 90% of the time, that's, that's what we do. So, all right. Uh, when it comes to your visibility, look, we're not just a digital agency. We, we represent, you know, physical locations and signage and different things like this. Ultimately, you want to make it really easy to find your location if you have a physical location, okay? Now, if you're an individual and you don't want people finding your address, then consider that. But if you're like a church or you have an office building or something, uh, even if you have a shared space, you want people to be able to kind of easily find that when you go to have a meeting with them, okay? All right. We're not going to all be on Zoom 100% of the time forever and ever and ever. I mean, we want to have a, a, an ability for people to find our office, right? So we want to make sure that that imagery is clear, clean, and it matches with what, what's online, but it's, it's just very simple. Some people have been asked us questions about, hey, what, should, I, should I wrap my car? Should I put this? Should I do that? Feel free to, to reach out to me and ask any questions like that. Uh, you can even put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll cover them. All right, so your micro assignment is to take that link from before, uh, givermarketing.com slash visibility and pop in your business name, your organization's name and um, grab the link or a screenshot and post it in the group. See what happens. Don't be embarrassed. We all start somewhere. Just whatever it says, just post it in the group and you'll get credit. And we'll have Visibility Vicky. She's one of our team members. Um, try to help you and guide you a little bit if you need it, okay? All right, third piece. How are we doing on time, Stacy? Give me like the, hey, you gotta, you gotta hurry up, Tim. Or, you know, how are we doing? Okay, we're doing okay, all right. Promotion. This is the fun part of marketing. This is where you get the word out. This is the, after you're branded and visible. Now you have like this strength and this confidence to promote in a different way than you did before. A lot of people waste advertising dollars on promotion because they're not branded and visible. That's another way to put it. So once you're ready for that, once you're branded and visible and you're to like at least a, like an A minus level, at least that, okay? Then you have a right to go go big time. Like, let's get the word out. Like, let's, let's take our little Facebook posts and everything. And like, let's start doing some ads or let's take our, you know, our business and maybe put it on, on, on Google search engines so people can find us more and, you know, all this kind of thing. Right. And I'm, I'm just talking at a basic level because there's so many different folks from different industries represented here today. Okay. Look, when you're doing an ad of any kind, a promotion, think, think about three things. The information needs to be clear. The call to action needs to be simple and easy. And there needs to be a way for you to engage or follow up or connect in some way very quickly. If you think of the ac acrostic ice, that'll help a little bit, okay? By the way, I just saw Vanilla Ice at uh, a big event a few, a few, uh, few months ago, and he still got it. I'm just telling you. Yeah, you like the memory device? I think that was good. And by the way, that's a true story. He was at like uh, some, some event in San Antonio when I was out there. All right, inform is like a monologue. This is where many organizations stop. They'll put an ad in some like, like on a billboard somewhere or on a radio or, you know, something. And there's just like not a lot of call to action. Like it's just, it's a mass awareness campaign, but there's not really... Like, okay, what do I do now? Like, thank you for letting me know you exist. And that's fine, but you need a call to action. Like you need something for people to do, like come visit, come sign up, click on this to learn more, check out our video, you know, whatever. Like you don't need to be spammy about it. You just let them know. Like if this is what you want to do uh, for an individual, set a time on my calendar, let's chat. In fact, Stacy. Pop, pop in my scheduler link. If somebody wants to connect, I, I, I'm liking the faces. I'm liking my friends here in the room. Let, let's give them opportunity for that 10 minute phone call. I'd love to do that at some point. Okay. Engage well and quickly. So you need to turn a monologue into a dialogue, right? We're not preaching and pitching people. We're, 
we're having a conversation that eventually that's what we want to have right we want to go from like here here's who we are to like let's have a real conversation and if people aren't interested they'll just ignore it it's okay but when you're promoting, whether you're paying for it or it's an organic push promotion, you still want to have a really clear engagement process. Okay, ask good questions. We'll talk about some more of that in a minute. All right, marketing is a series of experiments. Don't gamble. We need to measure our results, ladies and gentlemen. And this goes from the smallest startup to the largest company that you can think of. Or do you think do you think they're gambling? They're measuring everything. In fact, what they're measuring is kind of creepy, actually, to be honest with you. And <laughs> Khalil and others are like, yep, it's kind of creepy. Yep. But hey, look, we're in a world now where like everybody kind of has access to all sorts of information. So you just got to be who you are, do the best you can, protect your family and rock and roll. Like that's just I mean, that's just the bottom line. OK, but when it comes to marketing your business or organization, it's a series of experiments. You're always improving, right? It's the process of improvement. And there's that common phrase, you know, progress, not perfection. That's, and that's, that's really how it is with marketing. When it comes to actual promotion, there's several different categories or buckets that you can experiment with first. And I would say most organizations lean in on referrals. Healthy ones do. Otherwise, you're kind of scammy and spammy, right? So referrals is where you want to be, really, as a long-term thinking organization. But then after referrals, like, what else do you want to experiment with? Is it events? Is it some kind of print promotion online? Whatever, you know, radio, podcast, television, whatever it is, uh, leverage, you know, use this acrostic to kind of give you a guideline of what, what are the two or three ways that we get the word out? Like, how does that how does that affect, what are the results we're getting from these efforts? And you want to track every single one of these, okay? So pick two or three of them, go for it, experiment, see which one's the best bang for your buck and your time. The best bang for your resources is probably the best, a good way to put it. All right, referrals should be trackable. Events offer high value. Like we're having an event right now. Like you're in the middle of one. Like this is super fun, right? Um, if you want some print and get some, some fun things going on, on that end, print still works, by the way. It's just got to be very targeted. I got people sending me stuff in the mail that I, it's so creative. I've never seen such creativity before. This is amazing. They're sending me brownies and goodies and valuable things. Like, I'm like, whoa, like I used to pay for this kind of stuff. Now they're sending them this in the mail. Like some of this is getting really, really good, right? And we have we have programs and team members that kind of specialize in this kind of thing. So let us know and we can help you. Chick-fil-A is a great example. When they did that uh, dress up, up like a cow day and <laughs> put, anyway, <laughs> any, anytime you can get some physical items that represent your organization, it's, it's so brilliant. And by the way, did you see the stat on that? 25% increase in foot traffic on dress up like a, a cow appreciation day for Chick-fil-A. 25%. No wonder they're like the top, you know, fast food restaurant chain in the world. Like, oh my gosh, these guys are brilliant. They can turn a print campaign into that much foot traffic. What the heck? All right. Online. We could talk for three hours about digital and online ads of all different kinds. I mentioned some before. If you have more questions, just let me, you know, let us know. We'll help you out. There's a lot there, right? Um, there's some good use of money when it comes to digital ads and there's some not so good use of money, all right? But you wanna make sure that you're experimenting with, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then you turn on the gasoline, right? Radio and podcasts, some of you have a radio voice and some of you have a, a radio face. And so, <laughs> so we, wanna, we wanna make sure that we get you either on radio or podcasting or, or some kind of television ex exposure and have some fun with that. But remember, tell your story, tell your origin story. I'm telling you, it's the most magnetic thing on the planet. You know, even Jesus, he didn't do much without telling stories. I mean, think about it. All right, cool. Micro assignment, the last micro assignment. I think I, I think I missed one of our micro assignments, Stacy. Did I miss one? Anyway, um, no, no, no. We we have one coming up. We have one last one. Okay, promotion. Here we go. So promotion, 
your micro assignment is to literally post a business card, uh, an ad, a social media outreach thing that you did that kind of lets people know what you're up to. Some kind, something that is a little bit more like, hey, outreach, po promotion, like check out what, what we're doing, like that, that's actually reaching out to your audience, okay? So post some kind of screenshot or some kind of resource. Even if you've been on a podcast before and you want to post the link to that, that's technically like a promotion as well, okay? So post something that would fall under the category of advertising or promotion in the group. Okay, we'll give you some feedback on that and then you'll be you'll get credit for it as well. All right, nurturing. Here we go. This is a whole nurturing is kind of a funny game because you want to follow up with people before a decision meeting. And then if they don't donate or buy, you want to follow up with them again. <laughs> so it's like a sandwich. Like you have these decision meetings, but like Michael was alluding to before, you have before and you have after. So nurturing is like, by the way, most there's like only like one percent of people are ready to buy your stuff or donate right now what about the other you know 14 15 16 percent that eventually will well that's what that's what nurturing does it takes your one percent turns it into 15 percent this is where the gold is ladies and gentlemen if you believe in your mission your cause your direction of your organization this is where it is here's a simple way to start a follow-up system that almost everyone can do. 80% of sales or decision appointments occur after five minimum, a minimum of five trust building interactions, right? And I'm not talking about significant meetings with people. I'm talking about just touches, okay? Some kind of interaction where they get a kind of a well-rounded view of who you are, what you're about, and how you do what you do. First one's your introduction. Don't sell anything. Tell your story. And get contact information, which, by the way, is pretty easy to find. As long as you have their last, you know, first and last name and some basic idea of where they're from and what they do, you, you should be fine. You, could be able, you, you should be able to find it. But get their contact information. Don't sell anything. Tell a story. Then send a brief email. And again, you're not selling anything in that email. You're just, hey, great connecting. Maybe you ask a question. Maybe there is a next step, depending on how that first interaction went. Okay. Social media, connect with them on social media. What's wrong with that? They're gonna see your face again. They're gonna see a little bit more about you. You're starting to become like a virtual friend. Think about it that way. Like you're, you're developing a relationship virtually so that when you meet in person, you feel like you know each other. Okay, great. So social media, that's what that's used for, obviously. Reply to those messages if they send you something. And then give something they value. Give them an invite to an event you're going to, you know, something you're going to be at or give them a special ticket to this or bring them to something like, yeah, well, yeah, Stacy, exactly. Bring them to something like this or give them a physical gift. Maybe they mentioned something. I remember, um, I think Eric's on, the, on our talk, our training today. Eric, I was, I was uh, listening to uh, Chuck Bryant talk about something he really enjoyed or this or that. I grabbed something off of Amazon and sent it right over to his house. Just the guy, you know, he was just, he, I just wanted him to feel some love. He, he was having, having, having some good days and bad days. I just want to encourage him a little bit, right? That had nothing to do with business. Zero, like zero. But if you really pay attention, there's little clues people give when it comes to what they really enjoy. And it could be a, a tickets to a ball game. It could be anything, right? But at the end of the day, find what they value. Don't spam people with PDFs, links. Here's our, you know, here's our thing. Buy our thing. Like, you haven't earned the right to do that yet. We're still in that, that prospecting mode, okay? Invite people somewhere like this group, affinity group, special events, business meetings, um, anything that they would enjoy, anything that they would find value and invite them to that. If they're not going to find value in it, try to take them off your list, man. Like, just don't, you know, don't invite them if you can. I mean, if you can help it. That's where segmenting comes into play, but we can talk about that later. All right. Personal note. Talk to Stacy Stockford about personal notes. This lady's a genius at sending out messages, reaching out to power partners, individuals, prospects, you know, different folks, donors, different folks that you're involved with. Sending a personal note, uh, like on LinkedIn. Uh, used to be you could do it on Facebook and not feel spammy. 
you can still do it. You just got to do it with the right language. Make sure you're not, um, you know, just being out. You're just trying to be authentic. You're just having a real conversation. You're not coming out the gate pitching anything, right? Uh, snail mail is another good one. If you want to just send an individual uh, letter or card, uh, there's programs you can do that in like 30 seconds. Text messages, uh, those are always nice. I mean, if you got somebody's phone number, just send them a little note every once in a while. Talk to your top 100 or, you know, folks that you want to connect with uh, through text message on a periodic basis. That's a good idea too. But LinkedIn we found is probably the best when it comes to certain industries and then Facebook, if it's more like the nonprofit side. All right, so phone calls, keep them short, ladies and gentlemen. The days of having an hour long phone call are, you know, just right off the bat, it's just over. Like that's just not what we do. Uh, the social norms are changing around phone calls. Have you noticed? People aren't even picking up their phones hardly anymore, right? So you need to schedule that appointment, set up a you know, 10, 15 minute call, connect with them. Then, then the goal would be to set up a Zoom or an in-person meeting after that, okay? So that these phone calls are, are not the places, the, the term sales call is gonna go away from our, it's, it's, it's gonna go away from our vocabulary very quickly because you're not selling anything on a phone anymore. You might, you might be setting up an, an appointment, a decision meeting, but you're not selling, you're not closing the deal on the phone. You're not asking for the, you know, half million dollar donation on the phone. You know, you know what I mean? Like you're going to do that in person or Zoom or something, something, right? So that phone call is just a segue into something more intentional. And it's a way to screen and, and, and guard your time as well. And, and again, keep those phone calls really short. Don't leave voicemails. It's just not, it's just not. Uh, helpful. It's more counterproductive to leave long voicemails. If you're going to leave one, leave a short, short voicemail. Okay. There's All right. Always so, the saying of if you um, have a list that you're working from and someone that you don't want to communicate back with, then leave a long voicemail. If you want them to call you back, then leave it nice, short, and sweet, and then they will call you back. That's a good point, Stacy. I I was in uh, in a training talking about this nurturing process. And um, they said exactly that. That's exactly what they said. They said, hey, we, we work with, you know, multimillionaires and, you know, just just really high, high net worth individuals and just, in, in, you know, connecting with them. And what we found is if we leave those long voicemails, uh, we're basically telling them not to call us back because you've either given them too much information so they feel like they don't need to call you back or You've just gone on and on and on, and you've represented to them that you're going to waste their time. And so those long voicemails are not a good idea. Um, keep it short or don't, don't leave a voicemail at all. Just text them or send a, a social media message or something. Hey, tried calling you, hoping to connect soon, you know, something like that, right? All right. So the whole goal today was to try to help you, if you're a golfing fan, um, get to the green so that you can put it in, Okay. So the idea is, is, is we get you close so that you can, you can have a decision meeting and, 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 we can and you guys can take some action on some of the, the pieces that we've, we've presented today as helpful in marketing so that you can get in, in front of more people about what you're doing. If you're excited about what you're doing, just remember to move at the speed of trust. You must ask for the sale or the donation at some point but don't do it too quickly. And we're all pretty, pretty, pretty professional on this training. I can, I, I know who's here and there's, there's some, there's some quality people. So I don't see, see you ladies and gentlemen doing that, but for those who are watching the replay or watching in a different way, just remember, it's almost like that athlete, you know, when you're in the zone, I don't know how many are athletes here, but when you're in the zone, you can wait for the play to unfold. And then, you know, the timing. And it's natural, it's healthy, it's good, it's powerful. And so I, I, won't, I won't go too deep into that because that's more like sales training or whatever, but you got to know when that, that shifts from marketing to sales, okay? And that's really important. All right, you're nurturing your last micro assignment. Here, let me get it on the screen. Post your nurturing touch points to the group page. Just post three or four of them, five or six of them. Just get a, get, give us a list of how you prefer to connect with people, kind of the order that you prefer it. And then that, 
that acts as kind of a guide to your nurturing system. And sometimes it's very simple things like I just shared with you, like the introduction. Okay, so you have an introduction, you have a quick phone call, you have a this, you have an email, you have a, whatever it is, post it in order, and then there's your micro assignments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a reminder, you have, if you complete those four action assignments, been able to get started on your marketing accelerator package, earning that at no cost, $1,500 plus value. And what you'll need to do is get, uh, get those dialed into the Facebook group page, uh, add another three as you go along with us in our continued sessions that we have on Tuesday mornings. And you'll see those streaming live on Facebook, as well as we have a VIP Zoom room that you can request access to as well. All right, givermarketing.com slash group. Stacey, if you want to put that in the chat box again, that'll be helpful for folks to just make sure that they're up to speed on what's happening. Michael, how did I do? Did I, did I do okay? Was, was that good information? I like it. All right, all right. I like good. it. Well, we're going to take a five-minute break here, but if you have any questions about marketing, I'm, I'm going to stick around for our five-minute break in case anybody have any questions. And then Stacy's also going to put that, that CVI special link um, that we have available to, to kind of learn more about your core uh, identity and, and, and how you're wired and those kind of things, values that, that, that don't really tend to change too much. They're, they're there. They're, they're a part of your, your, your design. So we want to we want to discuss that a little bit more, Michael. You're gonna you're gonna prepare us for for greatness yeah. when it comes to our team and our culture. Tell us a, just a little bit about what you're gonna be talking about as we take. I like it. Break. And first, do you recognize the background at all? You hearing that? I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. What do you got going? That's, that's the Richard Cheese version of Ice Ice Baby. I had to put that in the background. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, ice, it's, ice, baby. The of Vegas all, slash Muzak version. Yeah, I had to throw like that it. out as soon as you did that. It's a, Richard, uh, somebody. All right, all right. Good. So anyway, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about the human side of everything. I mean, obviously, all this stuff is great information. Uh, Timothy and and Stacy, as always, that you have to just saturate with good stuff and tips. Um, the next immediate thing after that becomes okay. So who's actually going to do that, or how, or how do I build my team, or understand people? How do I assimilate? So we're going to cover that next. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as, as many of our team members will say, it, uh, for those who have to take a bio break or go pray for a minute in some way, shape, or form, um, please feel free to do that now. Uh, if you have any questions or, or need to take some notes or can't click through on a link or something, just let Stacy know. She'll, she'll guide you through that. And if you have any, any other questions, feel free to pop them. Just just raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and just free form answer the questions as you need. Any questions at all during the break? I'm here for you. Well, Michael had a good one going back to, I'm not sure if you've seen his, our little back and forth there about uh, voicemail, but he likes sleep voicemail. So he wants to know what, do you have some proven data about that and what it's like? And I just answered back with um, short voicemail, gives him the opportunity to just know a little bit about and the reason why they should call you back. So in, in my days uh, dialing for dollars, 100 phone, phone calls a day, right? Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of phone calls. When I left this message, this is the one that got me. And I'll, yeah, for people who are listening to this, they're going to get my real phone number. So here we go. All right. So, hey, uh, it, Tim just had a quick question for you. When you get a chance, can you give me a call? 916-919-1601. Uh, again, 916-919-1601. Um, yeah, should just be a minute. Talk to you soon. That message got like 10 times the response than if I were to say, hey, it's Timothy with Giver Marketing. I was just hoping to uh, talk to you about some things that I noticed about this, that, or another thing, or return your call about that proposal that, that, I, that I sent over, or this, or that, or another thing. Um, you know, here's my phone number. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to find out if you guys are ready to move forward or, you know, whatever, right. All that can be said on the phone call. So we, 
we've experimented with this over the years and those short voicemails are legit if you're gonna bring leave a voicemail leave the first name phone number twice and if they don't know your last name that's okay when you kind of say like 10 times more you mean like okay 200 phone calls, zero returns from voicemails versus 200 phone calls and 10 or 20 returns from voicemails. Because yeah. uh, I always feel like, and I was sharing this in the chat window, if people call me, but they don't leave a message, I feel like it's almost like a stalker or something. And I kind of think, con like, I think they're weaker or something. I don't know. It's like, well, you're going to call me, but you're not going to even tell me who you are, you know? Yeah, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll and this is this might be a personality thing, Michael. This might be let's get just a tendency because of my merchant builder thing going on. Yeah, I'm dropping that language right now. Yes. Um, uh, Tim, Timothy. Yeah. Um, my wife is uh, was a uh, virtual. She was an administrative assistant to a C level executive. Okay. And uh, whenever they call and they she say, okay, I'll put you through the voicemail. And when the C level executive got their voicemail, she just tap delete. Um, what I found out from her was to thank and get in touch with that, um, that gatekeeper and say, oh, you know, thank you. And I know you have such a tough job. You hear from guys like whatever, or even, you know, just get personal with the gatekeeper because they will route that call to where they won't delete it if you get the right gatekeeper. Yeah, the gatekeeper conversation is almost a, another one. I would even defer that to Stacy because mm -hmm. she does a lot of that for me and, and mm -hmm. others. You know, she she connects with, and we all connect with different gatekeepers. We we don't we don't we don't generally just make a phone call for the gatekeepers. We'll go through LinkedIn or some other private channel and email and and set up an appointment that way. And and we even keep that short. Like it's a conversation. This is not a. It's nothing else. This is a relationship building exercise, right? So yeah, good points, David. Good job. Uh, I will also say that if I don't leave a message, Michael, I generally will send an immediate text or a LinkedIn message saying, hey, uh, tried calling, uh, wasn't able to get through, but uh, ho hoping to ask you a couple quick questions. So something like that. That way I'm not viewed as that guy who's just kind of randomly spamming you know doing different things and that way they see my face there's a little bit more context too but yeah we're, we're using phone in a very specific way now very different than five years ago not even right. close not even close it's like like i turned my phone my ringer off two years ago right i don't i don't take a phone call unless i have an appointment yeah, it's funny how it's all changed, um, you know, because I mean, I think if we're talking about cold calling, that's one thing. If we're talking yeah. about following up with people and things of that nature, sometimes I'll leave a, uh, I could probably be more brief, but I'll leave a, a, a voicemail that's, that's personalized to whatever it is. And sometimes it's just concerns over where people are at in this day and age and things. Oh, but yeah. There's been a weird extra thing that's happened. I found I've lost business because everybody assumes that everybody has a cell phone. So people keep trying to text me and I have an office voice over internet line. Where'd you get my text? You got my text. No. Yep. Well, I texted you. Like they assume that everything, like nobody has a, a regular phone anymore. They only have cell phones, but businesses still have landlines. So yeah, it's yep. just how funny how it all evolves. There's different pitfalls with each, right? And, and opportunities. Yeah. Then it makes you wonder, did they see this text bounced back and it didn't go through? Like, I don't know, man. I don't know even if it <laughs> does, know. right? <laughs> all right. Uh, that's on them at that point. It's like, okay, well, your deal. Um, hey, ladies and gentlemen, Put your LinkedIn profile in the in the chat box. Let's let's network a little bit. I, I'm looking at everybody that's in the room, and this is this is a good place to to network. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say let's open it up for that. What do you think, Stacy? Sound good? Cool. All right, she's bouncing, bouncing over. Yeah, pop your LinkedIn profiles in the chat box, and you got you guys can all connect another time. And let's get let's get rocking and rolling, Michael. Let's make sure your your screen can share properly and get all that technology dialed in. Sure, we should be uh, good. And I just wanted to uh, yeah encourage everybody to try out the CVI that latest link, the erep.com forward slash e forward slash giver marketing. Um, <clears throat> that is the link to try out this tool. It only takes about ten minutes online. And I don't mind even if you all um, 
uh, do it while we're speaking because um, uh, the the interaction to have uh, with people on it is it's always more helpful uh, when it's when the one that says e rep on it, right? Yeah, yeah, e rep uh, forward slash e forward slash giver marketing. Um, so yeah, I and mean, if you guys get a chance to to take it and complete it, uh, that would be great. I found it super informative. Our team loves it, man. Just learning about themselves and how we're wired and all that. Yeah. So um, anything else, uh, Timothy, or uh, you want me to take over from here? That's it, man. Rock and roll. All right. Great. Well, thanks a lot, guys. And again, thanks again, Timothy, for your time uh, that, that you're not only pouring into helping us with best practices, but uh, given the time and, and, and chance for me to help share what we do <clears throat> for people and uh, if you all, as you're jumping back on, if you want to open up your uh, video, that would be great. Um, so we're going to talk today really about uh, organizations, the whole concept of marketing meets assimilation. assimilation. Uh, what is assimilation? Well, it, it's integrating uh, people in. And I, we deal with everything from businesses to help. Uh, we are actually change agents. That's what we are at Excel. We cause positive change. And the awareness to be built through what we do is, is it's amazing. We've got some great, happy clients. But uh, whether it's businesses or you're a nonprofit or you're a church, whether you're dealing with employees or maybe you're a startup with, you know, fulfillment partners doing web design and copy that are uh, 1099, maybe in a different country, all of those organizations have the same thing in common. It's the stewardship of people. And how well do we steward people? Well, the only question to go back and ask to, to measure that is how well have you done the last five people that you hired or the partners and contractors that you're working with? Or if anyone's tried to partner with someone, it seems like this is going to be great. But then when they get into the partnership, oh, crap, what do I do? How do I get out of it? Uh, if anybody's uh, leaders of, of, of faith-based or pastors and has volunteers, I ask uh, my pastor friends, have you ever wanted to fire a volunteer? And guess what? 100% of the time they crack up. And I wish, guys, that I could read their mics. I'll bet a million bucks some specific nightmare person <laughs> it pops into their head at that moment. It's like, oh, my goodness, I thought they'd be wonderful and this and that. They're well-recommended. You know, brother so-and-so said they're really great people, love the Lord. And then we put them into that, that seat and like, whoa, that was, how do we get out of that? And so that's the grand misstewardship of people. When we look at organizations, we have a measurement that proves the grand misstewardship of people. What is it? It's the 80-20 rule. It's just like, certainly in jobs, like Timmy said, if you're going to have somebody do 100 cold calls a day, you're going to have to hire 10, 15 people before you find a top performer in that role. And that's just because there's so much data to measure it, and it's a difficult job in some senses. But you look at any organization that has multiple people in the same job doing the same work, and you start to have the 80-20 rule show up, which means A, B, C, D performers. So... Uh, the opportunity, like in the book, Good to Great and things of that nature, get the right people in the right seat on the bus. And most all organizational initiatives, including the marketing that we're talking about today, is dependent on people actually able to execute and carry out those things time after time and day after day. And so as we look at where we stand, uh, what I want to contribute when I'm partnering with Timothy is just helping uh, people to understand the people equation. And with all of the market forces and change and constant evolvement and technology and different situations, of course, our health concerns and pandemic and everything coming and going, even without the pandemic, organizational change is difficult and bulky. Do you guys identify with some of the pictures here? Maybe you're like, hey, we were closing down. Then we were opening up. Well, are we opening up or are we closing back down again? Maybe you're like emerging out of the tunnel. Maybe you're still in the dark or maybe you're somewhat confused or have a plan. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, what that is. How do you find untapped talent? How do you capture and, and get the most out of people that are coming into your organization? Well, there's a tool. We found with all the great behavioral personality tools that are out there, there's even improvement on that. Anybody with a raise their hands, have you taken a behavioral personality assessment before? Okay, so we've all been exposed to them and they have some value. Um, this tool called the Core Values Index is separate from all of them. And here's why. This is not to disparage other tools. Some of them are helpful. They are well-known, uh, better known, better war chest, better exposure. Some of them have been around for decades. Why we're using a tool called the Core Values Index is it is not a behavioral personality instrument. It does not measure I am my behaviors or I am my personality. It actually measures and predicts how a person is wired 
to participate or contribute. And it doesn't matter whether you're at home, you're at work, or you're in a social setting. The impact is, and what we found when we're stewarding people, whether they're volunteers, interns, uh, 1099s, employees, leaders, rank and file, individual contributors, every human being, this is a universal mission. We can all write this down even if you want and reflect on it. Every human being wants to be known and validated for who they are and find a place to contribute, right? Regardless of our, our ethnicity, color, creed, intelligence, social, economic background, age, we all agree, we all come into this planet wanting to get some affirmation that we're valid and then find a place to contribute. If we don't, let's take the opposite extreme of that. What is the commonality in suicide notes? I'm not talking about extreme pain. I'm not talking about physiological uh, uh, you know, problems or brain problems or chemical dependency. I'm talking about the reason why, minus those crazy or extreme circumstances, the reason why someone will go against their all biological nature and off themselves from the planet is one thing. Who I am is obviously not freaking needed here, right? Think of all of us, of our deepest hurts and pains, it also boils down to, I'm trying to be my natural self. It's so not working, it's anti-working. And then I get very confused and frustrated. So the CBI speaks to that. It blows past, what do you do with a wallet on the street? Or are you more likely to speak up and praise or blame? That's a Myers-Briggs question. Well, it's kind of silly because if you want 10 salespeople to get a job in your company and you give them a praise blame question, nine out of 10 are gonna say, well, praise. Why would I disclose to you that I like to call it out like it is and I don't care what people think and I don't mind having confrontation? Would I share that if I want a job from you? Of course not. So the behavioral personality tools have some sort of social context that maybe changes over time. And what we are measuring is past. There is no behavioral personality in this assessment. It's just words. It takes only 10 minutes. We don't ask the same questions five different times and the assessment takes an hour. Well, why do they do that? And I see Khalil cracking up. It's because you see that like you're trying to correct for a false positive or you're trying to game the tool. But what we really want is to tap into the core unchanging nature of a human being that doesn't change and seek to honor that. And therefore, what we found is it's not skills, experience, and likability and how bright you are. Do I fall in love with you and see like I want you next to me for 40 hours a week working? What we found is that the most accurate predictor of future performance is if the wired fit of the person, the wired nature of the person matches the nature of the work. All the other tools, DISC, Myers-Briggs, Strengths Finders, the first analysis, all of them that I've seen have a repeat score reliability after one year of no higher than 77%, 60 to 70% is most all those tools. What does that mean? That means after a year, any of those tools that you take and if you retake them again, uh, one out of three or one out of four people are, are gonna start showing up differently just after a year. That makes it confusing, bulking, shifting information that's hard to figure out. The CVI is so simple. It's anti-situational, contextual, behavioral, personality, anything based or skills. It has a 94 to 97% repeat score reliability. Hold on, say that again. The CVI has a repeat score reliability year after year, decade after decade, 94 to 97%. That means when 100 people take it, 90, 95 of them are going to come out within a few points of where they took it over and over and over again. That now means that we can understand something stable, fundamental, and causal in every human being, how they want to participate. It predicts, it predicts what work they will find meaning in. What are and some of the other, uh, like, what are some of these other tools? What, what is their, you know, retail? Myers-Briggs is 60% after one year. It's what? not to mean it's a bad tool. It's just to mean that four out of 10 people are changing their type or it's highly effective of whether you take it at home or whether you take it at work. Oh, I see. So it's contextual. Right. And it, it's Situation. subconscious. People yeah. don't even realize, but we all can think when you look at some of these tools, uh, do I answer out of my work self or my home self or my real self? That's because they're measuring, they don't correct for the persona. Persona is a psychology term that says, uh, how I want to choose to show up and be seen in the world to be safe. But that's not always the true me. The CVI measures the true me, which is what's, what's your wired makeup that doesn't change and it's proven by the data that it keeps coming out the same. So then we can honor that. So we can know where to guide people better and align what I'm asking you to do all day long, the nature of the work with the nature of the person. 
let's take one concept that Timothy talked about today, nurturing. The idea of nurturing requires repeated follow-up through a system over time that's consistent in order for it to work. Well, there are people that would rather stick a fork in their eye than do that. So we can all agree, oh, yes, I should be doing that. I'm going to take my business to the next level. I read the book, 10 Habits of Highly Effective People. But why aren't we doing it? Because it's the difference between what I agree that I should be doing and my unique recipe of who I be. And whatever I'm going to be and what I tend to do is what I resonate with. What I resonate with is what aligns with my wiring. And we present at Exos Advisors a way to understand the unique recipe of how a person's wired. So if anyone has taken their CVI on this call and wants to bounce in and share, oh, it found, I tell, it, tell me what it found. I'm a merchant innovator. I'm a banker merchant. Feel free to interrupt and jump in. You can put in the chat. You can talk to me. That's fine. So these are my scores. I'm a little bit of a balance in the tool. And so I would offer for you all, for anybody to take this core values index, the CVI link, and then I'll provide a free DB for any of you, regardless of wherever you're at or whether any kind of you know, partnership or anything we have together. I love getting up in the day and pouring into people. I've had people tell me it's uncanny, eerily accurate. I had a guy in a coach training program that was a very smart individual, said, I've always taken these tools. They kind of feel a little horoscopish. I've never been gotten into any of them. He said in, in the half hour that I debriefed him, this is scary accurate. That's his quote. I had a guy that trains chaplains that's a doctorate in ministry and runs organizations uh, in chaplaincy, working with first responders. He said, this CBI taught me things in my marriage that years of uh, DISC and John Maxwell training didn't reveal about how I and my wife are wired. It's been a game changer. So we love it. We're having fun with it. Anybody that's 20 to 40 percentage points, higher, better, faster, cheaper, you have market differentiation. That's what we have, and that's what we're sharing with you. It is a four quadrant model. So I'm going to cover in the next 10, 15 minutes or so what it's measuring so you have some context. For those of you that already took it, it's going to unpack and give you some context. For those that don't, just say, hey, do you, do you see yourself in this? It's four quadrants, the DISC, MBTI. A lot of these tools end up being in four quadrants. Well, there's something to that. There are different ways of being that can be organized, and it does fall into that pattern. And the CBI is an advancement that continues to prove that to be true. You are only one core value at any moment in time, we will teach. And the CBI tells us, based on your scores, what kind of picture and where you're going to move and flow. Because if you have a higher score in something, you're going to you know, camp out there most of the time. But if you're like me, a squarish balance kind of guy, you're a little bit of everything in a way, jack of all trades, utility player. But I'm not master or specialized in any one of these. Somebody can be shooting out of the charts on one core value. We'll get to that. Uh, like Stacy's, for example, we'll share that later. So I'm going to go through very briefly what it measures. What's the discrete energy or human presence that is the key to assimilation, engagement, employment pre-screening, understanding my wife. I have three daughters. So my mission on this planet is clearly to be a minority in a sorority. There may be a point in the binary new future I never see the inside of a bathroom. But the thing is, is that all of my kids are wired differently. And it was before they were born. There were differences in the womb and the CBI pictures uh, what that capacity is. My oldest is a sophomore. Just last night, I'm writing a daddy email and I'm almost coming to tears, honestly, because I'm not just telling my sophomore about registering for Grand Canyon University and start to take dual classes. I'm starting to reveal to her what are the courses of study? What is the college majors? Look through these, honey, and see what you would like to be. I'm going to give her something that my dad never gave me, my mom, a sense of direction to point her towards certain things away from others. Not based on subjectivity. I'll be a doctor. That's a good living. You know, uh, it's based on her wired nature and I'm pointing her toward it and inviting her to the journey of self-discovery. But we already know more about her. And I'm writing this email. I'm like, wow, I, I wonder how this is going to come out. Because why? Because kids change their college majors. How many times? Four, five, six times. Why? Because they don't know what they're studying and they don't know who they are. So why don't we fix that and maybe reduce some college bills while we're at it? Anyway. Hey, Michael, I got to share. I got to share a really quick story. Just really. Cool. So I was a pastor for 15 years. If I had taken this and understand a little bit of my basic design and wiring, I probably would have at, at the very least taken that role on differently at the very least. Yeah. 
and probably actually taking on a different role within, you know, that kind of, of, of career or vocation, right? Uh, I would have taken a little bit of a different step in, in doing that. And I spent so many years without this awareness. So I, I, I can feel the emotions rising up in me, even as you're talking. So super, super helpful. Because when we look at our human condition, I'm sorry. I completely agree with that too, from where I came from in my background of being in dental and how I bounced around different positions in dental and what I truly loved in dental and how um, in those clinics, people wouldn't allow me to stay in that zone of genius. So it's so important that once you know what your employees and your team, how they're wired, keep them in that zone of genius. That's how you're going to flourish. And a lot of tools do a good job of this. And a lot of tools get like what Timmy said, personal awareness. And, and so the CDI gives that. But even more for Timothy, not just his personal awareness, but what about his direct reports? How are they wired? And then what about people three layers below him that are volunteering over a team that he never really gets much face time with? How do you know and understand and honor them and scale it? That's what we represent. And, and the misstewardship of people is everywhere, our hurts our, and, and versus our passions and the untapped talent. That's what we want to correct at Exos. That's what gets us up every day and why we are change agents. So the first core value, just going from the top left, is builder. The core value is power. It's flat out personal energy invested to make a difference. They are action results people decide and do. Ready, fire, aim. Doing something better than doing nothing, a builder power person says. And if I take the wrong action, that's okay. I'll course correct and get myself back on track. But I navigate by feel. And I'm catalyzed by faith. I'm not talking about religion or theology. What we mean is power-based people have a separate driver and agent, almost as strong as being power, which is faith, which is that I have practical confidence. Power-based people love to throw themselves at the effort until it's done, celebrate the results, catalyzed by personal practical confidence. I know what to do now. I know what to do next. Let's go. Power people have a sense of urgency to get the ship out of the harbor. That's unique to that core value. Anyone want to say, have a show of hands? This sounds a little bit like me or that you came out first in Builder Power. Not so much, okay? Timothy, I know you have it second. Well, then think about other people on the planet. They have a contribution. You want somebody to get it in motion right now with a sense of urgency and check it off the list. You need a Builder Power person. And um, the positive side of them, they get things done. How do you honor them? You let them go for it. People call builder power people like the disc really butchers this, I think. It says it's dominant. That's a mischaracterization, as if we have to submit ourselves to the dominant, the power person. No, I'm builder power first. I do not have to be an alpha dog. There's a difference between dominance, domineering, or control, quote unquote, and autonomy. Builder power people will celebrate and get results going while you're still thinking about it and wondering how people feel about it. That's their beauty. So to honor a builder power person, you let them go for it with guardrails. It's okay so that you know nobody's driving off the cliff or rolling over, or finding out where the landmine is by hitting it. But let builder power people be autonomous. Uh, for those that are faith-based, I put some things in about spiritual gifts. I think they're absolutely tied to some of them. Helps, service, apostleship, which is to break out and do things, kick open, open new doors. They're excited by results, results, results in a, in a way that's unique to other core values. Now, the dark side is when they're in fear, they can be domineering and pushy or not self-aware, and they can be dishonored if you undermine them, subvert, or if you're not being direct with them. There are so many people that read between the lines and expect others to do so, or that don't say what they really think. Builder people live and die by wearing their heart on their sleeve. And we can look at it as cringy, but there's one thing about builder power people, you know where they stand. Now, well, I'm going to withhold for time getting into an example of a major person that was in charge of something for the last four years that probably was a lot of this with not necessarily the sophistication of it. So our country lived and died by that. But there was stuff he did that everybody else that was mealy-mouthing and wallflowers didn't do and never did in their career. So that's the beauty and tension of that core value. That's what I want you to see. They're made anxious by anything that slows them down, and they tend to have a double down on self-reliance. And that's a strength that can turn into a weakness. Any questions that people have real quick about builder power or core value? It's a presence of being that some people possess with its beauty, its joys, and its pitfalls. I always thought of Peter as a, like a, 
like an evangelist dude. Is there, are there some evangelist type people that are in this category that just kind of movers, shakers, evangelist type? I don't think so. I, I think that some of them like faith and healing, when you talk about some of these things, they, they, they transcend. It's not clean. This tool is not a faith-based tool. It's yeah. not meant to do it. But I know what the tool does. It is so accurate in nailing the people that when there is a connection, there is a connection. Got it. Okay. That makes you sense. You put a highly creative big picture thinker into a health, health-based or service-based thing, you're misdoing them. Got it. We don't have to know all that much about, but know that we were misdoing people. The problem is in your organizations or church, you didn't know that until after you put them in. So how do you hire a volunteer? That's the problem. We want to change that in all organizations. So I'll offer a free debrief for anybody that takes the CVI and just reach out to me by LinkedIn or my Calendly. So don't feel like you're missing out on anything, but I want to pour into you all today. Uh, the second is the core value is merchant. The core value here is love. We're not talking about hugs and kisses, female stereotypes or nurturing sex or the Hallmark greeting card channel. In America, or the English language love, there can mean a lot of things. It's not like the Greek where there's 72 definitions of love or like the Eskimos that have 17 different words for snow. You know, is it dirty snow, clean snow, fresh snow, powdered snow, pea snow? What kind of snow is it? <laughs> well, love is a wide word. So what we mean by love is the presence. And all of these guys are the presence that walks into the room when this human being with this capacity brings it of their natural given state. So for builder power, it's take an action, get a result. The presence of autonomy to do stuff now with a sense of urgency. With love-based people, it's not hugs and kisses and stuff. It's the presence in the room that's working toward an inspired vision of what can be by deeply nurturing the true core in oneself and in others. I want to raise you up to the best version of you I know you to be, catalyzed by truth, which isn't facts and measuring with a stick and counting and comparing, but truth is an intuitive reality that you're for real, I'm for real. And when merchant people get around other people that are for real, they'll go deep and they'll love it. They'll lose track of time. There may not be a roadmap. We may not know where we're getting. It's not action results. It's about relationships and vision and the harmony that we're all in the boat together. Is this Come like on, an empathy, it. passion driver? Is that, is that what you're talking about? And it depends. When we talk about that, this is not a behavioral tool. So I'll always go to the motive. Got it. What okay. do we mean by empathy? If empathy means I want to connect with you and raise you up, then that's a merchant love. If empathy means I want to understand you or problem solve, that's a different core value. If empathy thing means I'm curious, and so I want to gather information or, or something that's different. It, 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 so it depends on what you mean by empathy. What's the other? Passion. All four core values can be passionate. You know what any human being is going to be passionate about? When they're honored. How do you honor them? When you know who they are and you let them be released into their zone of genius. Then they're going to be passionate. Find someone that's not passionate. This is the problem with the 80-20 rule. Leaders judge lower performers as bad attitude, poor work ethic, need more skills, let's march them all into a training. We've all been part of that in organizations and it doesn't really work because what don't you know about that? You don't know how they're wired. And we've proven in organizations, you can take a C performer that the nature of the person doesn't match the nature of the work and they're judged as bad attitude problems, people, who knows what we can do with them. We'd fire them if we could, but I don't know, maybe we don't need there. Sometimes they're good. But you move that C performer into a seat that aligns with their core values and they start operating like an AB player literally overnight. And, and I can prove it. Uh, I'll give some brief examples at the end of our time today. But love-based people, catalyzed by truth, relationships and vision, big picture, open-ended, and want to nurture and based on vibes. Do you guys hear yourself in this? Anyone feel they're merchant people? Open-ended vibes, relationships, and vision. And their learning styles talk and listen. So they tend to go based on a vibe or feeling. And you know what? Because they're working toward inspired vision of what can be, these people are orbited toward the future. They're always thinking ahead. Drag them into a bookkeeping accounting meeting or a performance review meeting or reviewing strategy, and they start to die on the vine because you're visiting minutia of the past and they're big picture future people. So the positive side, merchant innovator. All right, Chris, welcome. Chris, you hear yourself in this merchant energy, vision, relational open-endedness, and, and connection. You can unmute if you want. Yes, um, this was a very accurate assessment of who I am and probably have always been. Okay, that's what we hear time after time after time. 
And what a beautiful way to end it. Who I am and who I've always been, whether you're six or you're 106, you are going to get, there you go, uh, Timothy, empathy. You're going to contribute presence and connection and relational intuition. You've always had it, Chris. And so those of you that haven't taken or whatever want to jump in, I'll get to, you know, pull you in too and be guinea pigs. I love doing that. How do you honor merchants? Their contributions oftentimes are immeasurable. They're not like with a stick, but they're super essential, right, Chris? You ever been in a job where people were kind of browbaiting you over black and white concrete measurements and you felt like probed and cajoled because your contributions were very key, but they're open-ended, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've had it happen many times in which once I've left a position that they suddenly realize um, how yep. much I was doing and how much I contributed to the cohesiveness and the, the sense of inquiry and exploration um, that right. needs to happen inside of organizations. So um, yeah, it's sometimes a little, a little late. <laughs> right. So that was a lost opportunity cost in that organization. And what would be the future, would the future be like if we stopped that, if we tapped? And to be fair, the organization might have been frustrated because they wanted something different out of Chris, but they didn't know who they were hiring and vice versa. So there's that element, which is why we want uh, companies to purely define the nature of the work. They need our help in that. And then the tool has a 95% chance it's going to find a, a very close picture to that human beingness. And then you're going to get a top performer. So we use this way up in employment free screening. It's unprecedented. We actually guarantee performance. We will say that if you hire based on wiring, we're so sure you're going to get an A or B level performer that you can reuse our system for free. We'll support you until you get a top performer. Not a butt in a seat, not a human being with a pulse that, that's in the job, but someone that's engaged in the work, which assimilation and engagement in a way can be synonymous. To engage somebody is that you have them assimilated and they are contributing at the level and they feel like they are a part, okay? So um, yeah, that's just a misstewardship of Chris. And, and now we realize after she's gone and we've already frustrated and lost some of our talent, what we had. And that is the misstewardship of people and other outputs of the lack of, of, of improving on the 80-20 rule. Merchants are made excited by depth and creative inspirations. Um, the manipulation or the exaggeration is the dark side of them because they know what to say and then they choose not to say things because if a merchant doesn't have builder power, they know what should be said, but they don't want to rock the boat because they love the relational harmony. So they won't say it. They'll wait. Um, to dishonor a merchant, it's anything about non-relational or all about the business or self-centered or if there's only room for your vision and not room for the merchant to co-participate with their vision as well. They're made anxious by fear of man, which is, you know, what people think about me because I want to be loved. It's hard for me to be visualized as someone that's unloving, and I'll get into my dark side to get that back. And there's a way that we teach in our coaching how to help and honor people around not going into the dark side. There's some things we teach as a breakthrough. And they tend to idolize being loved, which is they live and die by whether people uh, are all getting along well in the room. I'm married to a merchant first. I am merchant last. I've always found that she stays up at night and worries about relationships. Right now in COVID, I have unique assignment as a husband to love my wife at the wired level. Because a merchant is all in on relationships, merchants take in relational context that they shouldn't. Hence, a Dr. Henry Crowd's book called Boundaries. To love my wife, this is very real and personal right now. She is internalizing other kids at school. One of them is scared. Her parents won't let her wear a mask. She's had seven members of her extended family die of COVID and she's a 15 year old and she's scared and her parents won't let her wear a mask. So my daughter's giving her a mask and my wife is internalizing this because she feels the connection of that. And I have to say, hun, that's not her problem. She's not our child. We can empathize with it, but to a point you will be exasperated and merchants pour themselves out until they're tapped out and because nobody's pouring into them. So I'm trying to help a boundary there for her. I love that you, you're thinking to that person, that's not our problem. We got to move into our problems so that you're whole and healed and you don't get wrecked during this time. So that's the merchant love core. Any questions about that anyone has? I just um, want to say the training that it comes through um, Exos Advisors, I have to tell everyone, it has definitely made me really understand how I work within a team and within an organization and my personal life. So it's definitely worth it. 
because who you are at work and who you are with your relationships and your children and your spouse is the same. The whole idea of work-life balance says that there's a threat between work and life, and we need to balance. Not a top performer. They and the work are one. They are at their zone of genius and calling. So why can't we do a better job of that? That's our passion. And so it ends up, like you said, Stacey, going into the personal. You know, we can drill down, Chris, about how you've been misstewarded. And you're, thank you for volunteering examples. But we're, we're very quickly talking about the fundamental essence that we still do a very poor job of, which is how to cultivate, honor, and know somebody at the capacity and level that they are. Not just general type. Not just painting with a broad brush, but a specificity to honor people down to percentages of the day. Wisdom. This is what, uh, uh, Chris, you scored second. So when you talked about part of it was they didn't allow your vision, but you were also the presence of wisdom. You said it. You, you figured out solutions and things that need to be improved. And maybe that wasn't really welcomed. Wisdom people understand the how and why of things. They're always noodling and tinkering around to figure out what to do about it to make it better. Their contribution is to assess and solve. And they remain empathetic, not like a merchant, and curious to understand a thing, regardless of the emotion of others or the behavior of others. Innovator wisdom people get in their head to noodle around the wise idea, strategy, or solution. Anybody hear yourself from that? So there's two sides to you, Chris. There's the feel it, feel it visionary futuristic, but then there's the let's put meat on the bone and get into the strategy. That's when you shift it from your love into your wisdom, and it's a separate you. You cannot be love and wisdom at the same time. You're one or the other. Now, do you hear when you shift out of love and into putting meat on the bone and noodling around, you're in your wisdom side. You're diagnosing things and problem solving in a process. Do you hear yourself in that, Chris? Okay. Now, if I want to hire only Chris for her wisdom, but she's merchant, I lose something. If I want to hire only for her love and I don't want her solutions and strategy, I lose something. I need to hire both if I want to hire Chris. They assess and solve, and the dark side is they use their questions because they feel defensive or hurt because you don't value their wise idea, strategy, or solution. So they interrogate or get defensive. The positive side is there's always another way. An innovator is the most contrarian of all core values. That makes them insatiably great no matter what you throw at them. If you say it can never be done, an innovator person will say, I want it to be done. I've had a wisdom person. It was years training the Myers-Briggs, and, and, and they said something unique. This picked up on my wisdom. I'm the person that says, give me the hardest assignment, because wisdom people love to solve problems. And in my opinion, I was teaching leaders in the, in the COVID area, the best thing you need in your organization is to tap wisdom, because no matter what goofiness is thrown at them, no matter what we're ignorant and don't know about conditions of health and, and processes, innovators are undaunted by that. They actually think it's fun to give them curveballs. They want to see if they can hit it out of the park. They, um, you can honor them with creative space, but sometimes they're so creative they keep solving problems when there's no more problems to solve. So they over-engineer or over-design and get stuck. And so you need to have some limits and guardrails for them. Um, they're into the logical side of things, um, craftsmanship, you know, evangelism. Uh, they're made excited by new ideas, logical creativity. They're in their head. Think of a computer programmer versus interior design. An interior design is a merchant because it's feel and vibe. A computer programmer is ones and zeros in technical structure. That's more of a wisdom person. The dark side is there that can be rebellious and nonconformist because they're so want to be validated for their wisdom that they like to kick down rules just for the sake of kicking down rules. I don't know why Chris keeps smiling. I've been guessing this might have been some sort of problem in the past. <laughs> but the wisdom person, to dishonor them, is you suppress their ideas and make them feel stupid. That's a quick ticket for them to go and take their participation somewhere else because they see there's no more room for creativity and you're crushing their logical creativity and their ideas. The insecurity of a wisdom person is that burying their ideas is the deepest part of them. They're burying their soul. So you gotta be careful about that. And you gotta be, be careful about letting them fail if it's really wrong uh, and let them go through their own wisdom process to reset. Otherwise you're getting their defense mechanism triggered because they idealize Sometimes their, their, their solutions, their ego, their persona, their validation is tied to honoring the wisdom core value. And this is the case with all four core values. Okay. Any questions about innovator wisdom? The final core value in our kind of, you know, shotgun, you know, 15 minute, 20 minute uh, broadcast of these, just to give you guys a taste uh, of the ways of being a people. Do you start to see how they're different? Builder power people, action, do now. 
merchant, hey, are we all in first? We don't do anything until it feels good. Otherwise, we might be hurting people and it's not going to be effective. And the wisdom people is, I got 15 different ways we can skin a cat. Let's talk about that first until we come to the right strategy or solution. And the banker, the final core value is knowledge, the most Spock-like of all four core values. Was Spock a good character? Yep. Was he warm? No. Whether or not the captain makes it back from the surface in the next half hour before the planet explodes, Scotty, is immaterial to our process to move forward. That's like a rough quote from what, what, what uh, Spock actually said. I think captain you did Kirk. a good job, Michael. I think that was a really good impersonation. I attempt to do that. Yeah, I'll do a couple of impressions in our time today, right? But um, logical. They literally are the human beings, and you can be a female. This is not female stereotypes. You can be a male and be a high shepherding love for guy. You can be a female doing triage in the ER, and it's all about the facts, the research, proof, measurement, and records. I'm a medical assistant. You are tissue. You're not a human being. I cut, repair, cauterize, and patch you back up. And that is a banker. That's a knowledge of precision. To know the facts through measurement, research, proof, records, rinse, repeat, they are catalyzed by justice. All else being equal, I want to make sure everything is equal, that it's fair, and it's equal access, opportunity, uh, and, and I want to measure it all. I want to measure it all so that we all agree on the standard. They're the most concrete of all four core values and the least tolerant of risk. The easiest thing for a banker is for us to do is nothing. Unless we quantify everything, we've reduced risk, and we have sufficient resources to amass. And so they are your risk radar in the organization. Guess what? In organizations, especially in corporate America, where we value big picture thinking, fast pace, and results, these are the most misdorted people. Because they're the fact checkers and seen as a wet blanket. Guess what? If you don't listen to them, you're going to have a multi-gajillion dollar lawsuit on your hands because you either got greedy or you didn't follow compliance. Like, I don't know, Takata airbags. Anybody had a recall in recent years? Oh my goodness, it was a nightmare for my 2006 BMW. Couldn't even get rid of it, couldn't do anything because it had a recall on it. Nobody had airbags because everybody had to fix them. Would it be fair to say, Michael, that these are the folks that help successful organizations stay successful for the long term? Yes, if you don't piss them off and cause them to go into aloof judgment. What okay. happens is they are seen as a wet blanket and they are seen as less intelligent because they're not big picture. Do you guys think Warren Buffett is smart? Does Warren Buffett, is he successful? Does he sound like a banker? He's still driving around possibly in 1986 Dodge Aries K. Why? Because he can. not You know what his internal motive is? I get off every year that I drive this car because I don't have to part coin for a new car that I don't need. He's a banker. He seeks to conserve information and resources for the good of all. And people see that as elementary, um, cheap or concrete or miserly. Um, and when you devalue a concreteness in the risk radar of a banker, you force them into a loose judgment. And you know what they determine? I've got all the facts. You guys don't honor me. So my information is pearls before swine. And they will see you and suddenly they'll be passive aggressive. Because then when you fall flat on your face, because you didn't listen to their quality and safety and what makes sense, you're actually telling them their human beingness is not valid and it forces them into their ego dark side, which is when you trip up and you fall flat on your face. They say, aha, I go into loose judgment and I'll let you fail. And then I'm going to prove to you because I kept a record for 15 years, exactly what you did wrong and why you hurt me and didn't listen to me. So how to honor them is to listen to their facts and use their information and show them how it made a difference. And you will have them beaming in their soul. They love helps administration and knowledge, concreteness to prove everything. What is the source of the information? They evaluate information more than anyone else to make sure it's the right information, not just sounds good enough information. Conservation and efficiency is their gift. They, they live and thrive. They can do rinse, repeat. That nurturing and follow-up could be done by a banker merchant, a banker that loves procedures and is, is keen with the process, and a little bit of merchant to make somebody feel good about who they're nurturing. Okay, so I got to put a plug in right now. We're looking for bankers in our organization big time and i don't know if this is the stats michael or not but we have maybe like i don't know 10 15 percent of our team is you know bankers right and they're they're oftentimes like you said maybe maybe overlooked on a couple of things here and there and right. so so we're really focusing in on that based on your help and some other things but 
Uh, if somebody knows a marketing professional who is a banker, please send them over. Now, I'll have some fun with this, guys. I'm going to throw Timothy under the bus. Um, what is your banker score? Do you have it first? Oh, just... it's not, it's four, man. Not only is it last, but it's off the charts. Like it's, it's antimatter. It's like anti, yes. I'm, so, I'm, Timothy is an organization. Is it possible that you hire people that you like? Like you hired Stacy because, you know, you like her. Right. Yeah. There's a likability factor for sure in the early days in the first, you know, 20 team members. But now we're going to another level. And Michael, your insights on this is right. just put a real focus on like we have to make this happen. So lots of small businesses are consciously or subconsciously attracted to hire people they like. I hire people I like because they're on my wavelength. They're on my wavelength because we have somewhat similar core values. So I end up hiring more me's. And I don't have any idea how to hire the opposite of me where I need it. And in fact, Timothy, it's possible that you did have bankers that came along, but you turned them off or that you weren't interested in them. At one and point, I do think that that was the case. And because of your help, we've, we've been able to turn that ship. But and uh, then it's yeah. not just we'll hire a banker. Well, you got to know what to do with them. And, and so we'll get into that. Okay. Uh, you've got to design your processes and know that. And so that's how we completely change organizations. Uh, the 200 level of the CBI is the, the, the sum of two of their contribution or two of their core values is the contrib contribution type. So the 100 levels, what kind of human being is a person? And we don't, for the time, we couldn't talk about capacity. It measures how much time during a day a human being is being the energy. So I'm a balance, but Timothy's profound in a couple of core values and he doesn't have any ability to get into banker. Well, that's a different human being. But if you hire a merchant innovator or someone like Chris, who's an, a merchant innovator, Chris, you are a creative contributor on the planet. You're not really a very practical person. I hope you don't mind and you're not insulted by my saying that. When I, is that okay? Yes, Chris. Yeah, I, 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 know, I know who I am. Um, I, I, I've, studied, I've studied this, not from this particular model, this instrument, but um, I totally accept my strengths and yeah. my and my um, other attributes. <laughs> and there's <laughs> nothing wrong. Attributes. Yeah, there's nothing wrong about browbeating you to be a practical person, which means rinse, repeat, do the same thing the same way every time and keep doing it and be motivated just by working through the process. It's likely that as, as you're a high creative, you'd rather stick a fork in your eye than be in that kind of a job. It's rinse, repeat. You guys ever wonder the human being, how they tolerate their existence when you go into that parking garage and that high rise and that person's just in the booth all day long taking tickets? It's like the human equivalent of a goldfish. How can you be in that role and tolerate your existence? Well, they're likely a high practical person or a long haul trucker or someone doing statistics or bookkeeping, mathematic calculations. Um, you need a lot of practical energy. Timothy's seeing the need through this that we need more people that ultimately just drive to that practical. It is a contribution that we need because creative people keep talking creative and it's all big picture. And uh, it's like a conveyor belt of creativity. And it's like that episode of I Love Lucy in the chocolate factory. Pretty soon there's so many creative ideas, they're stuffing them in their mouth and their blouse and they're falling out on the floor. Because we need a practical person to implement it or we get too much creative ideas. Make sense? That literally will happen in organizations. So that's a, that's a merchant innovator versus a builder banker. If you're on the top, this is Timothy. He's a merchant builder. You work on intuition and gut. If you're an innovator banker, you work on statistics, cognitive, and logical. You're a logical person. What happens if you hire the, the right person but put them in the wrong seat or if you don't get this right? Hire a cognitive person and put them in an intuitive seat. You will get paralysis by analysis. But if you want to design airbags the right way or get to another planet, you're going to need somebody with a huge amount of engineering cognition to work out the details that Timothy Morgan would never even think to answer those questions. Timothy would rather like set himself on fire and jump off a cliff than spend 72 hours asking 70,000 other questions just to prove out something. Right, Timothy? Okay. Yeah, because even the question about... Um... Uh, well, you know, do you have stats on this particular statement about this? That <laughs> I hit them off by even saying that. Can like, you prove what you said? And no. we, you know, we do have stats if we dig deep enough, but I'm not really interested in, I, I go by pure instinct and I, I can, I can take the information and kind of just see it at a broad scope. And I know what's happening and working 
from a human standpoint, just from my background and my core wiring and different things like that. And it's, it's fascinating when you break it down like this. Because he's a visionary. A lot of times these are like CEOs. Why? What is a merchant? Relationship, vision. What is a builder? Execute. What is a CEO? Vision, relationships, execute. Vision, execute. Relationships, execute. Okay? So we can talk generalities. Do you want something doing AutoCAD engineering and design? Uh, measure, analyze, prove, problem solve, triage, and improve, prove. Okay, that's a cognitive person. What happens if you put a banker innovator in outside real estate sales residential? They're going to come with a 32 page report about crime statistics, market upside opportunity, and school districts. But how do people buy? Not, not, not based on that. They probably buy based on emotion and does this feel right? So merchant innovators tend to be good residential real estate salespeople. Enough vision to connect and be authentic. We talked today about sales and how sales is bad. Sales is not bad. It's fake sales is bad to merchants. It's, it's the, the oiliest thing on the planet. So a merchant builder can build a relationship and not keep going with the relationship because you're too high of a merchant, but the builder will kick in and ask for the sale at the right time to actually get a result. Otherwise, we keep endlessly showing 900 real estate properties. Okay. Finally, someone can be a banker merchant, the diagonal axis, or you can be a builder innovator. I'm, I'm a builder innovator. So a banker merchant is all about the big picture and community. Remember when I talked about nurturing? Uh, Timothy's concept of the marketing principle of nurturing requires the tapping into the community. That's why I said the banker is the practical side of the community. I'm going to do these steps. And the merchant is the visionary side of the community, the intuitive. And I'm going to do it the right way so you feel good. You don't feel like you're a cog in a machine. Okay. And, and a builder innovator works on autonomy or independence. You want to break out a new um, market and need somebody to maintain 75 miles of oil pipeline? Better not hire a community person or they're going to be calling people and FaceTiming on their cell phone instead of turning gears. Why? Because they're a community driver. Okay. If you get these contribution types of the core values wrong, you can only budge performance, human performance so far. But, and it's going to go right back. It's like stretching a rubber band. That's what we do that are change agents and organizations. So our mission at Exos Advisors and our passion, causing business growth by helping anyone that's a leader or organizations to honor, lift, and optimize their people. How do you honor their person? By ping pong tables and Coke machines in the break room? Employee satisfaction surveys? No. That actually doesn't work very well. You honor a human being by knowing who they are and by not being surprised, but to actually cultivate the wired presence of a person, not be surprised by that and seek to um, validate it. And then put that in the organization where I need that energy. That equals you lift them toward their highest and best contribution. Every one of us can raise our hands, say that we've been in jobs where we've been misstewarded. Chris volunteered an example of that. It was not only maybe that she wasn't performing as well as that they needed the job, honestly, Chris, not to get too personal, but it was the lost opportunity cost of higher contributions Chris could have been allowed to do if we put her in the seat that needed it. And if we do that in the organization, we can actually defeat the 80-20 rule and we cause an increase in engagement, assimilation, or human capital productivity. Assimilation is just putting people where they belong. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I wanted to say thank you for the term uh, steward stewardship um, in this case. And I think in terms of... Um, individual performance inside of organizations, what I have experienced is that um, if I'm if not I'm not honored and not supported and listened to and the, and the things that would be meaningful to me in terms of filling a role, um, eventually I will begin to um, check out yep. of the work. And then it begins a cycle, a performance appraisal cycle that is negative. Right. And this, is, and this is probably my, one of my main reasons for um, opposition to most performance appraisal systems inside of organizations, because they're, they're, they're sort of missing the, the real point, which is to motivate people inside of organizations to, to, to be their best and to use their strengths. But somehow the performance appraisal systems actually uh, diminish um, the right. the the dedication to your role to the organization. So, um, but I've had this sort of a negative spiral happen sometimes. Right. 
So two things are happening there. And we know enough of, of Chris, you know, I've never met her before, but she's a merchant innovator. And I just showed you the contribution type of a creative. So two things are happening. The lost opportunity cost of saying no to uh, Chris's uh, vision and her strategy and solution. And in response to that, we need to now pay attention to Chris. So we're going to put her into the, the performance review environment when we're already losing her. And we double down on what? Does a performance review process sound like more creativity or does it sound like practical? So we sentence Chris to a downward spiral where we're starting to measure her even more by practical, which is going to berate her even more because we're not honoring her. Okay? Does that make sense? What I would have done if I was Chris's direct report is I would have broken 10 to 15% of, of Chris's day, and I would have given her any special project around her passions and allowed her a little bit of autonomy to run with it. What would that have done, Chris, if only 10% of your average day you would have given, uh, been given a new place to play for your creativity. It had been fabulous. And, you know, some of my greatest successes is when, have been when I've been allowed to be creative and right. to come up with, you know, solution ideas inside of organizations that ended up being, you know, wildly successful. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've had good examples of being allowed to use my creativity. Yep. And so it, it's that simple. This is a 10 minute tool and we find it in minutes. So just with a little bit of time we have today, I'm going to go through a couple more pictures and examples. A score of 26 points to 36 is the, 36 is the highest. A score of 26 points or higher is profound. This is the actual score of a former mega church senior pastor that led a large church that actually didn't do very well. Why? Why did a person with this profile not do very well? Does anybody want to take a rough stab? The innovator is the presence of wisdom, logical complexity, and problem solving. He wasn't a shepherd. Okay, very good insight. Which core value do you think is the most tied to a shepherd, David? Well, I, I would think merchant. Okay. So you're right. Any other observations anyone has? Thanks, David. I love doing this. I, I, this I'm a practical person. By you saying that, David, you've honored me because I don't really know how well I'm doing in people's day until I feel like the learning is transferred and people have aha moments. So we could just be totally authentic and vulnerable. So he was not a shepherd because he was so strong on his innovator wisdom that it was strategy after complexity, after innovation, after strategy, after iteration, after iteration. And um, it was two things. Number one. He was so strong in it, he was likely over innovating and people cannot keep up with that because he's not around a team of 29 point innovators. Number two, the sum of two core values is a contribution type. He is far more independent than community. So guess what he wasn't doing? Not only was he not shepherding, but the CBI diagnosis with laser focus, he was never inviting his team along enough. Even though he had this second, he could have shifted from his wisdom into his merchant and been present more, but instead he was likely overly creative and the logical heady side of creative in his own world and probably frustrated that people couldn't keep up. So guess what? He has a thriving practice as a consultant to this field. When you hire a consultant, what are you hiring? A wisdom strategy person. This, this, this picks it up in, 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 in five minutes, I can see what would be going on if they told me this situation. And I look at a score because of the strength and accuracy of it. Let's talk about somebody else. Stacy Stockford, she's volunteering. Whoa, out of 36 points, she's 31 points of merchant. You know what that means? 90% of her human energy and capacity starts and ends every situation around the core value contribution and presence of love. And la -di da like Timothy, who has four banker, she doesn't have any banker. So I typed in in the background something I heard today in the chat window from Stacy. Nurturing is so important. Says a 31 point merchant. Of course, it's so important for you. You see, guys, you can actually see the key signature, the frequency that comes out of the very words of people, of the human spirit, of the most important thing, which is who I am. Mm -hmm. She's got to be in a role that's all about relational creativity and exchange all day long. And that was her challenge being misdirected in the dental practice until she quit. Mm -hmm. Is this fun? You guys want to go with a couple more examples or how are we doing on time, Timothy? 
We're at the top of the hour here. How's everyone in the room doing on time? Would we like to keep going for a few more minutes or do we have any questions or comments? Type in go if you want to go. Type in chill if you want to chill. I hope you guys just at least see a picture and I'm happy to give more examples because this isn't about inspiration and cloud talk and um, big picture wide net. It's about application and the ability to, the number one challenge for assessments is A, they pigeonhole people. They pigeonhole people because I would say they're either not very accurate or they're distilled down into generalities, but um, it's because of, of, of the now what. And I want to give as many now what as I can with people. Here's an Michael, actual, how, do we, how do we get a hold of you? Uh, do you have that screen that we can share uh, just your basic information as, as we wrap up today? Feel free to uh, capture this if you want. Um, it's my phone number, the Calendly link. You can um, schedule a debrief with me. Those of you, anybody that takes the CVI through that link and clicks on this link, I'll, 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 it'll be at least up to a half hour to talk with you about it. And I don't care if we're not a fit or I never speak to you again. Uh, my goal is that um, there's no agenda except to pour into people about who you are and what the opportunity is. And Exos has very happy clients. You can look at our webpage, uh, exosadvisors.com, uh, what our clients say. We're trying to capture stories about what we do. We have very happy clients. Thank you, Michael. Great job. Stacy. do we have any last, last uh, technical things or, or thoughts or ideas that we need to make sure we, we, we don't forget as we wrap up? Uh, no, I just want to make sure that everyone feels welcome to take the CVI, um, the CVI link and get the results. There's no cost to take it. Just no, take no it, right? No cost. Yeah. Free. It's free to take. And when you spend some time with Michael and actually go into this, you will really feel honored with who you are as a person. And that's what I've learned. I've done the course now um, twice. I've gone through twice. And any opportunity that I have to go through again, I definitely will because each time, I meet and connect with other people. And it's all about our connections, right? It's all about, that's where my merchant comes out and the nurturing comes in place. It's all about connections and, and um, knowing where to go to find those. And that honoring system has really been helpful to me in my personal life as well as my, as well as my business life. So I encourage you. people to do that. Thank you, Stacey. Hey, those who want to save the chat, just click on the three dots in the lower right corner of the chat save the entire thing. And then you'll have everybody's um, LinkedIn profiles, Michael's, uh, you know, scheduler. You can just schedule something right now, that, that's fine. Um, but you'll have all that information, some of the chat and some of the people's names and other folks. So God bless you guys. Have a great, great week. Make sure and, and stay uh, connected with all of us. If you have any questions, we're here for you. We literally wanna help. And then all the other uh, business conversations happen on the back end of adding value. So we'll see how that goes. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye.